in our discussion today, we're turning, as uh, Professor Aaron said in our, at the end of our last uh, session, we're turning to something completely different, the topic of ecclesiastical practices, which are called adiaphora, or indifferent matters. They really weren't indifferent, I don't think. They were matters that were part of the activities of the church. Uh, and, and I know that church activities always uh, arouse a certain amount of discussion, but why did these adiaphora, these ecclesiastical practices, uh, raise a fuss in the 16th century? That's a good question, and you're right about they always arouse a certain amount of discussion. Sometimes I wonder whether or not it's easier to change the teaching of the church than the practice of the church. Uh, try changing the color of the carpeting in the church um, and see what kind of a debate it will uh, create over and against uh, sometimes teaching. But this goes back to the earliest days of the, of the Reformation when uh, Luther and Melanchthon made a very sharp distinction between the doctrine of the church on which it was absolutely imperative that we agree, particularly with Rome, and then the practices. Mm -hmm. uh, not that practices were unimportant, but practices were ways for how we express our teaching, and there could be different ways of doing that. So they were willing to acknowledge different um, forms of practice. And so we already saw in the Augsburg Confession that it was divided into two sections. Mm -hmm. There were the articles on doctrine, 1 through 21, and then there were articles on abuses, abuses and practices, 22 to 28. And these dealt with things such as monastic vows, uh, the eating of foods, giving communion in both the bread and the wine, and so forth. Um, the Lutherans were willing, a little more willing to um, allow for different expressions in practice than the Catholics were at that time. In fact, in the Augsburg Confession, um, something like ecclesiastical practices uh, is the title of, of one of those doctrinal articles, Article 15. In Article 15. So after they deal with 7 through 14, all of which deal with very important doctrinal issues, the doctrine of the church, baptism, Lord's Supper, confession, the call into the office of the ministry, then they take up the issue of practices. And this especially becomes important in the apology of the Augsburg Confession, where Melanchthon argues quite vehemently that observing certain practices is not necessary to one's salvation at all. As the medieval church had taught in certain instances. Yes, it did. And so Melanchthon goes out of his way to make the point, if it has not been established by God, it is not necessary to do. And moreover, because Christ alone is our sole savior, our sole redeemer, Nothing dare be added as a supplement to his work. Medieval religion had, had suggested, or at least in the popular mind, had b believed that a ritualistic way to God, in other words, certain, certain religious practices that we perform actually appease God, reconcile us to God. Mm -hmm. and, and Luther and Melanchthon wanted to make the point, God saves us by, by a word, by, by conversing with us, bringing us to trust in what he has done for us in Jesus exactly. Christ. And in a sense, now we are back to the two kinds of righteousness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the word which makes us righteous in God's eyes over against the practices mm -hmm. by which we organize our lives. But this immediately raised another question. Well, if we don't have to do these things, if we don't have to follow the custom of eating meat on Fridays, if we don't have to go on a pilgrimage, if we don't have to go to certain shrines, if we don't have to observe uh, different regulations for different festivals, does that mean we can do anything we want? Well, the concern was then there would be nothing but chaos in the church and chaos in society. So in Article 15 of the Apology, Melanchthon says, while these things are not necessary for salvation, it doesn't mean that they're unimportant. Uh, in fact, uh, within the life of the church, God has given human beings the responsibility of ordering their life together. That is, 
identify where it is you're going to gather for worship, what time you're going to, how you're going to structure your service. And so Melanchthon makes the point that yes, while we are not obligated to follow many church practices for salvation, that doesn't mean they're unimportant. Mm -hmm. And so while there are there are adiaphora, which means uh, that the, these things are neither commanded by God nor are they forbidden by God. I think Melanchthon uh, develops his understanding in such a way that I would say, while certain practices are adiaphora, not all adiaphora are created equal. In that sense, indifferent could be a misleading translation of adiaphora. It's a literal translation. You're right. But they aren't completely indifferent. They aren't even really neutral, as I like to say. But they are simply these matters that, that we have to use human wisdom to decide. Exactly. In other words, they're not matters of indifference, <laughs> Yes, you might say. And I think uh, Melanchthon develops what I would say are four principles for determining what adiaphora are good adiaphora uh -huh. or better than others. And the number one principle, I think, is does a particular adiaphora contribute to the teaching of the gospel. Mm -hmm. So if you take uh, the order of service, do the hymns teach the gospel? Does the sequence of the parts contribute to the gospel? Does one use uh, Bible readings that work through the entire Bible? Even something like the church here allows for teaching the gospel because the first half allows one to teach the entire life of Christ from his incarnation to Pentecost. And in the second half of the church here allows one to uh, teach the uh, book of Acts and the life of the church. So that is a humanly devised organization for the church here, but it's a good one because it teaches the gospel. Now, I like to think of these four principles almost with the analogy of a uh, bicycle with training wheels. <laughs> and the principle of teaching the gospel is the wheel, the front wheel of the bike that steers the bike. Mm -hmm. So, again, it's the most important. I think you could even use it, for example, in thinking through the architecture of a church. So that when I come into a church building, whether it is uh, a Gothic style or contemporary style, my eyes should be drawn to what we would call the centers of gravity, what goes on there, namely the table or an altar. Right? a pulpit, a baptismal font, because these tell me, here is why we're here. Mm -hmm. God is coming to us with his word proclaimed in water of baptism, in bread and wine of the Lord's Supper. But now there are two more principles. These are, are what you could think of as the training wheels of the bicycle. Mm -hmm. And they're related to the nature of the church. Uh, one principle is that of mission or I would say context. The church in developing its practices must take into account the context mm -hmm. in which it is doing so. In other words, people need to be able to understand what is going on. So for example, one of the first things Luther did was he translated the worship service into German and provided German hymns. As long as it's in Latin, people cannot understand what's going on. And that would be sort of an application of the contextual principle as people say today in, in linguistic theory, uh, Luther and Melanchthon were receptor-oriented. Yeah, uh, they are sensitive to how people are receiving and interpreting things. And that may apply to musical forms, that may apply to the language that we use, uh, the technical words or non-technical words that we use, and so forth. So that principle, in a sense, is related to the outreach of the church the extension of the church into society. The other principle is what I would call the uh, Catholic principle or principle of continuity. This is related to the unity of the church. It recognizes that the church over 2,000 years has developed certain practices that have withstood the test of time. Uh, you might say they are what, tried and tested or tried and proven. They've shown their value. The example of the church year, mm -hmm. uh, certain hymns, even sort of the 
order of the service from confession and absolution to the word to the prayers to the sacraments. There's a certain tried and tested practices that are worth hanging on to and allow us to express our unity with other Christians. So, for example, saying the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed in worship service um, allows us to express or allows us to join our voices with Christians across 2,000 years and with Christians all over the world today. So you have a contextual principle and a principle of continuity. Now, I like the analogy of training wheels because what happens whenever a child first gets on a bicycle with training wheels and they go down the street, if you watch them from behind? They're always sort of wobbling back and forth. And so any time, I think, within the church, there will be times when we put a little more emphasis on the contextual principle but if you go too far, you're going to tip over. Mm -hmm. So then you also have to maybe come back and put a little more emphasis on the continuity principle. And like I said, it's a bit of a balancing act. Mm -hmm. Finally, the fourth principle is the rear wheel. This is where we do things together as a church. So that even though in America we prize our individualism, as a church, we are a gathering, a congregation, a, um, a community of God's people. So this is where, while I have freedom to do whatever I want, I try to take into account my fellow Christians. And so I moderate my freedom in love. In fact, Melanchthon will actually talk in this kind of language. The way I think it would work out is something like this. Suppose a pastor comes to a circuit meeting and says, I want to move First communion for my children up to fifth grade. Now, most of us do it in eighth grade. I think it would, other pastors might say, well, could you give us six months or nine months to reflect on this with our congregations, to prepare them so that if they have questions, why does this congregation do it this way and we don't, or how shall we receive them into communion and so forth, give us time to work it out. It'd be entirely appropriate for the first pastor to say, sure, we'll not implement it next week will hold off. That's kind of working together or moderating our freedom in love. And so Melanchthon actually says, with regard to the Diet of Augsburg in this very assembly, we have shown that we're willing to observe adiaphora with our opponents, even if they're somewhat burdensome. Mm -hmm. But any married couple knows that. Now, though, as we move into the period after Luther's death, things become a little bit more dicey. We're moving into another generation. Uh, now we're into a period after the small cod war. Emperor Charles V has won the victory. And he starts now demanding that all the practices of Roman Catholicism be reinstituted. Now this is going to create a problem for a number of Lutherans. There are going to be those who say, well, some practices we can observe because, for example, whether we were an ob or not, doesn't really matter. There are others who are going to say, no, no, no. We cannot do that because it's a matter of confession. Because taking off this vestment 20 years before had been a symbol of, of leaving behind the Roman obedience. And now if, to put it on again as, as part of this appeasement of the emperor would confuse the people and make them think you were going back to Rome. Exactly. And I think in a book that you wrote some time ago, uh, you indicated that there were, in fact, examples where when the Reformation came to some territories, people continued to wear the That's vestments. Mm -hmm. It was not a sign of being part of the Reformation at all. Mm -hmm. In others, they got rid of them mm -hmm. as a symbol of joining the Reformation. Well, when Charles comes along and says, you must wear them, well, for the first group, it wasn't a big deal because it was never a symbolic act. Mm -hmm. For the second group, however, it was. And they knew, and they were very sensitive to the fact that actions speak louder than words. Mm -hmm. So if you suddenly have prayer candles again, if you're suddenly wearing the same vestments as the Roman Catholic priest, and you're doing other practices, people would look at those actions and say, hmm, we must 
have gone back to the Catholic Church once again. Mm -hmm. In that context, in the context of persecution, in the context of saying you do this or you will be sent into exile or you will lose your position or you will lose all your goods, people said you better not compromise. Mm -hmm. An adiaphron is no longer an adiaphron. It is a matter of confession. And where the emperor says you have to do it, you don't do it, even if it's a matter of an adiaphron, because as soon as he says you got to do it, then it is no longer an issue of freedom. So again, the reformers were really receptor-oriented. They Very were much. concerned about how their actions, how their use of ceremonies would be perceived by the people and what difference that would make to the way they understood the, the heart, the core of the Christian faith. Absolutely. Um, you know, as I mentioned, actions speak louder than words. I think they recognize no matter how much we tell our people, we've, we're still Lutheran. They would interpret the actions in a different way. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the difficulties of Article 10 is it really is dealing with the issue of persecution. And so the question in part is, how do you apply it today? Mm -hmm. Because we are not living in a country where the governor of the local state is going to come in and say, you can't use the lectionary anymore, or you can't wear that orb anymore. And if you do, you're going to jail. So how does one apply that in our particular context? I do think at the very least, we have to take into account, as the reformers did, how something is perceived. If we do something that looks, say, more evangelical, if we do practices and we wear vestments that people would identify with, say, Robert Schuller or Presbyterianism, we have to at least ask ourselves, is that a message we want to give? that we are actually identifying ourselves with this movement or with this church by our practices. And the same thing can apply on the other side if we suddenly start engaging in certain practices that, are, that have traditionally been identified with Eastern Orthodoxy or with Roman Catholicism. Will people perceive that, oh, well, we're becoming more Catholic or more Eastern Orthodox or we're becoming more evangelical. So there's an important balance to be maintained in recognizing how things are being perceived. But even there, I think, returning to Melanchthon's principles, it can be helpful in the sense of asking, is the gospel in all its fullness being taught? Mm -hmm. Recognizing the tension or balancing act between the contextual principle and the principle of continuity. But I think perhaps maybe most important in our day and age, is somehow we do this together as a whole church, and not just as an individual pastor or an individual congregation. Because having joined together in an organization called the Lutheran Church of Missouri City, we sort of bound ourselves together. And just as I have bound myself to my wife, I suppose theoretically I'm free, I can go out partying every single night of the week without her. But you know what? I've chosen to moderate that freedom because we're married. Mm -hmm. And so we do things together. And that's not an easy task. But it's probably one of the most important tasks we can engage in uh, today. So that while the 10th article of the Formula of Concord recognizes that we have freedom in regard to those things that are neither mm -hmm. commanded or forbidden. It also reminds us that the most important factor to consider is what kind of witness we give to the gospel. And, and it insists that we give a clear confession, not clear in our minds, but clear in the ears and in the minds of our hearers, of the receivers of the message. It's got to be clear in the minds uh, and eyes of our hearers. You're picking up on this sort of the contextual principle. And it has to be consistent with 
the teaching of the church throughout the ages and throughout the world. Because even in Article 10, the authors of the formula of Concord believe that the most important thing is conveying the life-giving word that we have in the gospel of Jesus. Into Christ. the lives of the people, yes.